Sovereign Lord Jesus. With joy and gladness in our hearts, we greet thee this morning. We have come to meet thee here today, for we have heard thy promise that if we are willing to love thee and to keep thy commandments, thou wilt thyself reveal thyself to us. And we have read how in olden times thou didst reveal thyself to our early fellow Christians, to Mary and to John and to Peter. And we come hopefully today that by thy grace thou wilt reveal thyself to us. So help us, we do beseech thee. We thank thee for making this day possible. We thank thee for all those who have worked hard to arrange it. We thank thee for those whom we have left at home, who by their sacrifice have made it possible for us to come. And now we seek thy grace. Grant, Lord, that thy calm may descend upon us now. That thou wilt give us freedom of heart, remove from us any worries we may have, and as we lay down our other responsibilities for these few hours, Lord, quieten our minds and invigorate them, we pray, so that today we may love thee not only with our hearts, but with our minds, and do thou, our blessed Lord and teacher, teach us thy word. Lord, as far as we know in our hearts, though so thou knowest them better than we do, we are prepared by thy grace to do what thou dost teach. So we wait on them, expectantly, and in advance we thank thee, for thy name's sake. Amen. It is a positive delight, ladies, and an exceedingly great stimulus to me to see so many of you gathered here today and from so many different places as I understand it. I have been practicing the names of these places as the organizers have given them to me. Some have been a little difficult on the tongue, but I've been practicing them, and now I can say Tawasawasam <laughs> quite correctly. An Ukri Naga somewhere there is, and some of you are from there too, and I'm delighted to see you. I hope you have joy today in meeting one another, and I shall look forward to meeting as many as I can, though our prime purpose, as our chairwoman has said, is that we come to meet the Lord Jesus today as our Lord and as our teacher. And we join him today in his school of holiness so that he may instruct us and we learn just a little more today the great secrets of being and becoming holy. We shall find our blessed Lord, of course, the most skillful of teachers and the most gracious. In the course of his teaching, as we have it in John 13 to 17, when the apostles didn't understand anything, they interrupted him. And Thomas said this, and Philip said that, and Judas said, I don't get that bit, Lord. Please explain that again. Which shows us how gracious the Lord Jesus was. Nobody was ever afraid to interrupt him. I hope you won't be afraid to interrupt me if necessary. We shall also find him very skillful in teaching because he teaches us in order, putting the easy lessons first and then the more difficult. 
so teaching us in the order in which we must experience these great matters of holiness. And so we're going to follow his teachings in John 13 to 17, not dealing with all the detail, but taking from them their main point. And we start with chapter 13, and two of the lessons that there our Lord Jesus taught his apostles. Chapter 13 contains two enacted parables. The first one is the washing of the feet. When the Lord Jesus took a towel, girded himself, poured water in a basin, and began to wash his disciples' feet. And the second great enacted parable is when our Lord Jesus exposed the sin of Judas by giving him the sop. Two enacted parables, and the first of them will show us, talk to us, about that great washing that is the first step in becoming holy. It is so important a step that if we have not yet taken it, then of course we are not yet holy and cannot proceed to become holy. The first parable then about the initial and subsequent washing by which we become holy. And the second great parable, a lesson on what holiness is and what we should be aiming at if we would become holy. A lesson taught us by the exposure of what the opposite of holiness is, what sin is, as distinct from holiness. But now in our first session, we come then to the first enacted parable, it's John chapter 13, where our Lord begins by washing his disciples' feet. And of course, that gracious and humble act was in the first place meant to teach the disciples and us our duty to engage in humble, loving, lowly service as our, of our fellow believers. But there was more to it than that, wasn't there? As we see now, as we break into the story and read what Peter said when the Lord Jesus came to wash his feet. Peter saith unto him, this is chapter 13, verse 8, Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith to him, He that is bathed all over needs not save to rinse his feet, but is clean every whit. And you are clean, but not all, for he knew him that should betray him. Therefore said he, you are not all clean. So then we see immediately that it is not merely a lesson in humble, lowly service. It is a lesson in these two washings by water. There is first of all, says the Lord Jesus, a complete bathing from head to foot, a being bathed all over. And that bathing is once and for all. So that if we have been bathed all over, thereafter we only need to rinse our feet. Two washing. The once and for all washing, and then the constantly repeated washing. This is the lesson that stands first in the school of holiness, if I say to myself, how shall I become holy? Then the Lord Jesus will say, you will need to be bathed all over. And if we say to him, how shall we remain holy? 
He will say you will need constantly to have your feet rinsed. Washing by water, therefore. And that makes us consider something fundamental, something elementary, but fundamental. What does the Bible mean when it talks about cleansing by water? We'll notice, won't you, that it was water that the Lord Jesus put in the basin, not blood. You'll see the New Testament talks of both cleansings, doesn't it? It talks about cleansing by blood, and it talks about cleansing by water. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin, says Holy Scripture. There is cleansing by blood. But then other scriptures talk of cleansing by water. In Ephesians chapter 5, for instance, Paul says as follows, that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water. And so we put these two things together and we want to ask the Lord right now, Lord, what do you mean? Sometimes you say we're cleansed by blood and other times you say we are cleansed by water. Please, what is the difference between the two? And why is it that when we're thinking of becoming holy, it is cleansing by water that we need? Let's think about that, therefore, and ask ourselves a simple question. When we say the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us, what do we mean? What does it cleanse us from? And how does the blood of Christ cleanse us? The blood of Christ is not like some detergent lady. There were pagan religions when the candidate was put down in a pit and a big ox was brought and stood over the top of the pit and they put a sword right through the ox and all the blood of the ox came washing down over the person that sat in the pit. And in that pagan religion they would have been talked of having been bathed in the blood. But that's paganism, that isn't Christianity. The Bible talks about our hearts being sprinkled with the blood of the Lord Jesus. And why do we need our hearts sprinkled by his blood? Well, the writer to the Hebrews explains it. Hebrews 9, 14. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, says the Bible. If the blood of bulls and goats and the offering of a heifer sanctifies to cleansing your flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ purge your conscience, says the Bible. That's what the blood of Christ does for us. It cleanses our conscience. You see, when we sin and break God's law, and the Holy Spirit begins to convict us that we have broken God's law, we have incurred the penalty of sin, there is a cost to sin and that penalty must be paid. Then, of course, our conscience begins to be worried and fearful and we can't get the thing off our minds and it worries us. It worries us in the morning when we wake up. It worries us as we're cooking the, the food. It worries us as we go to bed at night. Conscience telling us that we have broken God's law. We have deserved the penalty of God's law. How shall we get rid of that evil conscience that reminds us that we have deserved the penalty of our sin? And the answer to that in the Bible is the blood of the Lord Jesus. How does the blood cleanse our conscience? Well, the blood of the Lord Jesus is the token of his death. See, the blood of the Lord Jesus, it shows he's died, doesn't he? And then the Holy Spirit tells us why he died. He died to pay the penalty of our sin. He paid the debt we could never pay. 
He suffered the penalty of the law. He died in our place. Here's the token of it, says God. Look at the blood of the Lord Jesus. And When we see he has paid the penalty of the law. And we no longer have to pay. And we are forgiven. Then, of course, our hearts begin to sing again, don't they? Our conscience is cleansed. The debt is paid. So the blood of the Lord Jesus cleanses our conscience. And you might well ask, well now look, I've trusted the Lord Jesus. His blood has cleansed my conscience. Why do I need any further cleansing? Why do I need this other kind of cleansing, this cleansing by water for? Well, we can ask the same question as we did the first time. We ask, what does blood cleanse? So now we better ask, what does water cleanse? What kind of things does this water cleanse? Paul tells us in that passage that we've read from Ephesians as follows. This is the kind of thing that water cleanses. Christ loved the church, gave himself for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present the church to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And here we've got our answer, haven't we? If the blood of Christ cleanses us from guilt, the water cleanses us from wrinkles, spots, blemishes and any other things. And it's a bit of a chauvinist, isn't it, that's standing before you with a talk to ladies about spots and wrinkles or blemishes or any such thing. I shall have to watch myself. I shall only get one bun instead of two at lunch, you see. <laughs> but there is a difference, isn't there, between guilt on the one hand and spots, blemishes, pimples and any other things on the other, you see. Let me tell you, now, a little story, you'll say. No, not that it ever happened to any one of you, I'm sure. But here's a good lady, you'll say. And she's down the town one morning in the car. It's her husband's new Cadillac, and she's been allowed to drive it, you'll say. And she's down the town, and suddenly looking out the window, she sees a long-lost friend on the other side of the street. And, of course, she wants to attract her attention and talk to her, and she leans out of the window and says, Hello, hello, Katie. And I ask Katie, Oh, bang, something goes, yes. <laughs> Oh dear, then there's the front of the Cadillac right gone in. Mm -hmm. So she comes home and she makes her husband a super duper dinner. <laughs> um, after dinner she says, you know, there's a little thing I've got to tell you. Oh really? Well yes, I was downtown today and uh, when I wasn't looking a stationary lorry hit into the back of the car, uh, into the front of the car, scratched it a bit. And the husband says, however did it happen? Well, I was talking, you'll say, to my friend, and, uh, uh, well, this lorry hit into the front. Uh, have you done much damage? Well, I'm afraid the radiator is wrecked. And for the moment, uh, the dear husband can't contain himself. You say you wrecked the new Cadillac? <sighs> Any idea what that's going to cost? <laughs> But then being a good man in the end, he says, never mind, my dear. Only a bit of old metal anyway, isn't it? Are you hurt? No, you're not hurt. That's marvellous. No, no, we'll get the old Cadillac repaired. He forgives you, doesn't he? And plants a spanking kiss upon your brow and forks up the cost of repairing the Cadillac. And you go to bed with a peaceful conscience, yes. You've been forgiven and he's paid the cost. Suppose one morning at breakfast, however, he puts his head above the newspaper and sees you there and says, my dear, um, whatever is that on your cheek? Which I think is a pimple. He says it looks worse than a pimple. Looks like you're getting a positive carbuncle or something. <laughs> oh, my dear. Um, then what does he say? He says, quite spoils your beauty, my dear. 
Now, I forgive you nonetheless for having a pimple. Well, of course he doesn't. You don't forgive things like pimples, do. Nor wrinkles, nor any such thing. Even the ladies themselves wage a merciless war on wrinkles. Uh, yeah. Hmm. No, the husband doesn't forgive the wife for having a carbuncle on her cheek. He says, my dear, I don't like that. I like you. I love you still, but I don't like that. And you must get rid of it. We'll have to get the doctor in and uh, give you a tonic or something and get rid of it. And the more he loves you, of course, the more uh, relentless he is. Getting rid of the old spots and wrinkles or any such thing. That spoil your beauty. And that's how it is with the Lord Jesus, isn't it? His blood cleanses us from the guilt of the things we've done and said wrong. His blood doesn't cleanse us from our pride, our selfishness, our bad temper. The Lord doesn't propose to forgive our pride, you know. He proposes to get rid of it. And we have to make this big distinction in our minds, don't we? Yes, the things I've done, thought and said wrong, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me from the guilt of them. But the wrong attitude, they've got to be removed. The Lord Jesus isn't going to be content until he's removed the last wrinkled spot blemish from our characters and presented us before the throne of his glory with exceeding joy, unspoiled in our beauty. So then there are in this matter, in this matter of holiness, there are these two basic things, washing, the once and for all washing, and then the repeated rinsing of the feet. Both are necessary, but of course the big one is the bathing all over. That happens once and for all, says the Lord Jesus to Peter. You know, as you see, when the Lord came to Peter and began to wash his feet. Peter protested and said, Lord, no, 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 no. I'm never going to have you wash my feet. And our Lord said, but Peter, if I don't rinse your feet, you have no part with me. And then going to the other extreme, like he was uh, uh, wont to do, Peter says, oh, oh, well, then wash me all over, Lord. Head, feet, everything. No, no, calm down, Peter, he said, man. Uh, 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 he who's been bathed all over, doesn't need, say, to rinse his feet. The commentators explain, don't they, that in those far-off days they didn't have uh, um, bedrooms with bathrooms attached. There was one, perhaps, bath, public bath down in the middle of the town. And if you needed a bath after six months, you went down there, you see, uh, and got a bath, you see, and then... Uh, you came home spanking nude, you'll see, for the next six months. And our, uh, when you got home, nonetheless, having walked up the sandy street, you got all grit between your toes and things, and uh, your feet were a bit soiled by the dust. So you pushed the button and called your slave, and in came the slave, and got a basin and, and, and rinsed your feet. But, of course, you didn't need to be bathed all over again, not at that juncture anyway. Hence the idea, he who has been bathed all over only needs thereafter to rinse the feet. Two experiences then. The first experiences in becoming holy. What is this? Bathing all over with water. It's not, of course, literal water, is it? We don't need to be told that. Our Lord Jesus made that very clear to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were much given to sprinkling holy water around about the place, you'll see. And they wouldn't even eat them until they'd rinsed the tips of their fingers ceremonially, and some of them, being enthusiasts, would, would wash themselves right up to the elbow before they ate their food. 
And when they saw the Lord Jesus' disciples eating their food without having first washed their hands ceremonially, they objected. And our Lord Jesus looked at them with compassion and yet with indignation. Gentlemen, said he, what good does your external washing do? Yeah, there's nothing wrong in washing the hands. Of course there isn't. Washing the body for that matter, it makes the atmosphere a bit more pleasant. But I do say, mm, and keeps the old germs away from the stomach. But it's not dirt on the body that's our chief problem, is it? It's that other kind of dirt. For it's not the things that go into the body, said the Lord Jesus, that defile a man, but it is the things that come out of him. For out of the heart proceed that ugly brood of things that defile us. Evil thoughts, jealousies, cattishness, fornication, adultery, envy, jealousy. They come out of the heart. And no literal water, however holy, can touch them, obviously. What kind of water is it that can reach those dark places of our personality and cleanse them? Pete Paul gives us the answer, doesn't he? In his letter to Titus. I'm going to read it to you, if I may. Titus, it's chapter 3. Titus chapter 3 and its early verses, and while perhaps you're finding the place, let me warn you that I have to pause at five minutes' time while somebody does something with something up aloft in the recording area. Uh, so it's not that I have incipiently lost my memory if you'll see me pause for a few moments at a quarter to. Here is Paul talking to his young colleague Titus, Titus 3, Put them in mind to be in subjection to the rulers, he says, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready unto every good work, to speak evil of no man, not to be contentious, to be gentle, showing all meekness toward all men. What a lovely character that would be if only we could attain it, wouldn't it? But he says, you know, Titus, the Cretans are a very difficult crowd. In chapter 1, Paul tells us about them. He says to say, they are evil beasts, liars, idle gluttons. Now, I must be careful what I say because I have known some delightful believers in modern Crete, so we'll accept them, shall we, and talk about the ancient Crete. But there, one of their own selves has said it. He said, I mean, their own perts admit it. One of their perts has said, the Cretans are always liars. You couldn't rely on a word they said. They are evil beasts. They'd tear your very insides out with their sarcasm, their envy, their jealousy, their cruelty. Idle gluttons, always wanting to be fed, never prepared to do anything. Everybody's got to wait on them while they sit back and gorge themselves. Nasty type. How are you proposing to turn them into, deli into delightful characters without spot, wrinkle or any such thing? It's not a question of forgiving the guilt of their bad deeds, merely, is it? What's the sense of forgiving them? if you don't change them inside, and they carry on living like it. And say, we're going to heaven because the blood of Christ has cleansed our sins. What, you find yourself a lot of evil beasts, gluttons, and liars up in heaven. Couldn't be, could it? By what process then does God propose to change them, cleanse them, and make them beautiful. 
Coming back to chapter 3, Paul says to Titus, don't be too hard on them, old boy, because, you know, we too, ourselves, weren't too good, were we, before we were converted? We ourselves also were on beforehand, verse 3, chapter 3, foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. When we look back, that's marvelous. And start making them holy. And start making them beautiful. Well, not simply by the blood of Christ. There is, I know, a lovely hymn, and I sing it with all my heart, you see. You have to allow the hymn writers a little bit of license to it. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood. Oh, I like the hymn. I sing it with all my heart. I think it's quite true. It should be, would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the water. So that's what Paul is now going to expound to us. Great cleansing once and for all by water. But here I pause while they do things. On. Here then is the answer to our question, but when the kindness of God our Saviour and his love toward man appeared, not by works done in righteousness which we did ourselves, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing, the constant renewing thereafter of the Holy Spirit. Now notice the next metaphor, the Holy Spirit whom he poured out upon us. You would take a great vessel of water and pour it out on people who needed a bath. Washing of degeneration then, the constant renewing thereafter of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. And we come to the basic step in becoming holy. Not just a little reform outside, but what God calls a revolution, a regeneration produced by the Holy Spirit himself when a person is born again. This is absolutely fundamental, you know. For failing to understand this and more for failing to experiencing it, to, to experience it, there are many well-intentioned people that are trying to live a Christian life that they've not yet begun. They're trying by all sorts of disciplines to make themselves holy. They'll never be so in God's sight. Why? They haven't taken the first step. The first step is nothing less than regeneration. The implantation of of a new life. When we are born again, we receive the very life, and with it, the very nature of God. And there begins to spring up in within us a life that wasn't there before, a life we didn't possess before, but a brand new life that brings with it new powers, new desires, new outlooks, new powers and potentials, new desires, new longing. It is the very life of God. And you see what a lovely thing it is. Don't let's make it sound difficult. Or you'll say this is the gift of God. This is the big thing. It's not a something we do. It's a something God does through his spirit 
when we come in repentance and faith to the Saviour and receive the gift of new life. But it is vastly important. Sometimes things go wrong with people precisely because they've tried to be holy without being born again. Peter tells us in his epistle how that in his day in many Christian churches there had arisen false teachers. Men in the pulpit that would say it's okay to be homosexual if you want to be or lesbian. When did you last embrace a lesbian? Men in the pulpit that were homosexual themselves and taught the believers that all kinds of immorality and permissiveness were all right for Christian people to practice. That is not a new phenomenon, lady. It's as old as old can be. Some of the Christian churches in Peter's time were afflicted by this kind of wickedness. And the trouble was that some people in the church who were recently seeking the Lord and wanting to know the gospel and seeking after the Lord Jesus became attracted by this kind of thing. You see, it's easier, isn't it? And you can make it look nice by saying that Christ was never critical, you see, and he's always loving and so should we be. And some of the early converts, apparent converts, were attracted by it and fell into it. And Peter says, you know, their last state's worse than the first. Better for them not to have known the way of truth than having known it to depart. Why have they been bowled over? And Peter says it's happened unto them like the old Greek uh, proverb. Uh, uh, the sow that was washed went back to her wallowing in the mire. Did you ever hear that Greek proverb? It's a Greek one, really, and St. Peter quotes it, so I have permi his permission to repeat it, you'll be. Uh -huh. um, it's a nice little story in its way. And that concerns an old sow, you'll say. And she lived in one of these ancient towns where there was only a public bath down the road. And recently she'd been watching the ladies go to the public bath, you'll say. And they went in their old togs. But when they came out, what a transformation, you'll see. Their, their cheeks were glowing, you'll see. And the beautiful new dress, the style was delightful. And a diamond or two from the old ears. And uh, oh, how they pranced up the street in their new pair of sandals, you'll see. And the sow was looking at this and saying, no. The time came when the sow decided that she would like to be a lady. Why not? She thought she didn't see any big difficulty in it at all, you'll say. So she went to the bar and got herself scrubbed all over. So she came out glowing pink, and the old tail was a bit curly at the back, and it was the latest style in piggery, and she looked beautiful. And then she got a dress from somewhere, and she put the dress on, and an earring in the snout, which you'll see, the ears weren't very useful for that purpose, and, uh, you'll see, and then she practiced walking on her hind legs up the road, you'll see. Oh, she was doing marvelously. Until she came across a big old puddle of mud. And forgetting all about being a lady, in she went, wallowed in it, mud, mud, glorious mud. I say, why ever so? Well, because she'd been cleaned up outside. And she'd never been changed inside. No new life. That's perilous, ladies. And we shall need to see to it not only for ourselves, but in our Bible study groups, can't we, and in our Sunday school classes, wherever we have opportunity to witness for the Lord and to help our friends. If people are going to be holy, it's not enough to be cleaned up outside. They need to be changed by receiving a new life inside. And it's not difficult, is it? It's the gift of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lesson number one. Bathe all over. 
This is how we approach God into the holiest of all. Our hearts sprinkled, that is, with the blood of Christ from an evil conscience and the guilt of sin done away. And our bodies, says Hebrews chapter 10, bathed all over in pure water, born again, becoming a child of God. But once we have been born again, bathed all over, then there is the constant need, isn't there, to let the Lord rinse our feet. Just as Paul says, the answer to these evil things in our character is one, regeneration, washing of regeneration, and two, the constant renewing performed by the Holy Spirit. And we come today to wait on the Lord Jesus to do this again for us, don't we? To take the water of his word and begin to rinse our feet. Where contact with the world has defiled us, where living in the world has shaded our minds and our outlook and we might be in danger of becoming worldly in our thinking, in our ambition. He draws near graciously with the water of his word to cleanse us, to point out where we have become compromised, where our hearts and minds are not as pure as they should be, graciously, to rinse our feet. That too is important, isn't it? You'll say, a believer once washed all over, once born again, cannot cease to be a believer. And sometimes we can behave as though we weren't, can't we? As though we weren't believers. And you see, Peter said, our Lord, if I don't rinse your feet, you have no part with me. Some translations have it, you have no part in me. That's wrong, of course. If you've got a translation like that, take it back to the bookseller and ask your money back. You'll say, it should be, um, you have no part with me. Every believer is in Christ and in Christ eternally. But if we don't allow him constantly to rinse our feet, we shall have no practical fellowship with him, shall we? <laughs> Suppose I'm given to a bad temper. And the next door neighbour's cat will constantly come into the garden. Now, just a while ago, she flattened all the daffodils. Now she's gone and sat all over the primrose, you'll say. I've had enough of this. I'm boiling over, and I happen to see the next door neighbour, and I said, that cat of yours, beastly thing, ought to be gassed. When are you going to gas it? Look what is under my flower. What do you think you are? You think you own the whole place here? Oh, I really tear her. And as I'm walking away, I say, Oh, excuse me, I've forgotten something. We've got some gospel meetings in our chapel going on uh, uh, next week. I wonder if you'd like to come. And the neighbor says, No. One cat's enough in my garden. <laughs> Wouldn't want to go where there were 200. And when it comes to having fellowship with the Lord and winning that woman for Christ, perhaps we shall never have any part with him in that, shall we? So two things then. The initial, once and for all, bathing of regeneration and new life. And after that, the daily rinsing of the feet, that we might always have fellowship with the Lord, and increasingly so, as the days go by. The Lord bless our study of this.